Okay, welcome everyone uh, welcome. to the Reclaim webinar. Uh, this is uh, number 11th in this uh, webinar series. Um, if you are new to this webinar series, so uh, the Reclaim is a UKRI funded uh, network plus, which is uh, um, you know, supported by the other uh, three councils, which includes the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, NERC, which is Natural Environment Research Council and Hearts Arts and Humanities Research Council. And there are um, the five universities who are involved um, in this network. And this is, these are our, uh, you know, the, the list of uh, co-investigators. So they come from uh, the UKCH, Bangar, Warwick, Bath. And uh, uh, my name is Prashant Kumar and I am the principal investigator on the, the network. So Reclaim, it, it kind of, uh, you know, the full form of this is uh, reclaiming forgotten cities, turning cities from vulnerable spaces to healthy places for people. So the network is started in um, March 2023. I think it's uh, uh, been nearly a year now. And uh, we have uh, uh, launched this webinar series uh, of 18 webinars, uh, which will go until March, 2024. And uh, this is the webinar which is happening once every month. And uh, uh, we had a, um, we had uh, the, the, for example, in the, the last webinar series, the speakers uh, talking, uh, you know, talking about uh, the green and blue infrastructure uh, from the different perspective. Uh, usually we had two speakers in each webinar and uh, the whole idea there is to share the best practice and uh, facilitate knowledge exchange between the practitioners, researchers, policy makers, businesses, and uh, you know, the different environmental groups. So, um, I mean, this is an, a kind of an open invitation. So you could always uh, you know, write to us um, or there is an online form if you're interested to be one of the speakers um, about this on this webinar series. Uh, you could, uh, um, you know, you could find that information on the Reclaim Network website, and uh, that is reclaim-network.org. Uh, we can put that into the chat box, um, and you can find the information. And if you're not a member, you can also become a member of it. So today, a webinar. Um, we have a pleasure of having um, two uh, distinguished, uh, you know. The, the academics, the one come from the Western Sydney University, and uh, uh, he's a collaborator at the GKR and also the Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, you know, the, the fellow at the Surrey University. Um, and he's gonna talk about uh, the Australia's largest small blue, a smart blue green infrastructure project. And then I have uh, another, um, you know, the colleague, we know each other for a very long time, Professor Stefan Lehmann, and uh, he is the director of Urban Future Labs at University of Nevada in Las Vegas. And he'll be talking about uh, the regenerative design of the urban environments. So before I introduce uh, my uh, first speaker, I would like to uh, uh, say a few, uh, you know, the housekeeping notes. So first, in case of the questions, so um, we will have these two presentations, 20 minutes each, one after another, and we will take the question and answer um, in the end. And that will be chaired by my colleague, Dr. Nidia Kalavilo. So she's also the co-investigator on the Reclaim Network. Um, you can use the Q&A back box you can see on your screen and please type your question. You can put your name and your affiliation if you want that to be um, read with your question. So Niria is gonna uh, pick your questions and read out to um, our speakers and they can answer your questions. The second thing is that this webinar is recorded. So um, you can see that uh, uh, you know the webinar later on or you can share with your colleagues in case they are not able to join today um, and uh, we will put the chat uh, in the chat you know the the link of our youtube channel so you can find the previous webinars there as well and uh, the third thing is that if you uh, please keep your microphone on mute uh, just to avoid actually the disturbance during uh, the the webinar process so uh, without further ado i'm gonna introduce to uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Sebastian Foch. Uh, he's an associate professor at the Urban Transformations Research Center at Western Sydney University. 
His transdisciplinary research is built around the complex issue of urban heat. He develops innovative and practical solutions for government organizations and industry to cool urban spaces at a range of spatial scales, from small playgrounds to entire district council areas. His quality research is documented in the form of more than 100 papers, reports, and books. He worked regularly. Um, his work regularly features in the media, uh, such as the BBC, Life at 50 Degrees. It's a very interesting program. You can look at uh, uh, online. And in 2021 alone, led to more than 350 headlines in 21 countries, published in five languages and reached more than 1 billion people. So Sebastian is a, a friend and a collaborator, and he's currently visiting the University of Surrey. Uh, it's a pleasure to have him. So Sebastian, over to you. Thank you for that kind inv invitation to visit and also to introduce me to your Reclaim network and today's webinar participants. Hey, hello, everyone out there. Um, I will just start sharing my screen. If you can let me know with a thumbs up that you can see this screen all right. Great. Thank you, Charlotte. As Prashant indicated i am here as a visiting fellow and i just wanted to have a quick disclaimer and acknowledge the fellowship that was granted to me by surrey's institute of advanced studies so i'm very thankful and hopefully this is the start of some more work um, with surrey university today i will talk about simpact simpact is an acronym that stands for smart irrigation management for parks and cool towns and before I get going, I've got a little video so that everyone can start to understand why this work is really important, particularly in a place like Western Sydney. Brace for a scorcher. Records are expected to fall as parts of Sydney reach 47 degrees tomorrow. The horrific heat will come as many head off for holidays. And tonight we're being warned not to take chances with our health. South Australia, 46 degrees. Melbourne, close to a record. And Sydney, it's coming our way. A toxic cocktail of heat and haze. Tomorrow, the smoke will be back. A hazardous cloud, which has now made it all the way to Melbourne. As the winds turn northwesterly tomorrow, that smoke will start to affect the more populated places along the coastal strip. During a month of city smoke, hospital emergency departments have had 30% more people showing up with breathing problems and asthma. Certainly, tomorrow is not a day for outdoor physical activity. Tomorrow, Sydney's west will be as hot as it gets. Penrith could be up to 47 degrees. Richmond also 47, Liverpool 44, Campbelltown 44 and Parramatta 42. The risk is very real. Uh, the risk for those uh, who are vulnerable, that is the elderly and the very young, uh, it, these conditions could be life-threatening for them. But the numbers don't always tell the full story. This team of researchers from Western Sydney University is tapping into tree trunks across Parramatta to see just how much water these shade providers need. They're also using tin cans to map heat across our west. This summer it's Penrith. Uh, we're covering hundreds of square kilometres of urban built environment, but also natural environment. They're dotted around suburbs, hanging in trees, measuring minute by minute changes in temperature. On a day like tomorrow, it could actually feel like 60, maybe even above 60 degrees. It's a, it's a big difference. Yesterday, as temperatures broke the 40 degree mark, their equipment measured a feels like temp of 56.6 degrees at a Granville playground. Heat like that, the surf and sand a bit. I'll stop there. I think the story is clear. It's very, very hot where I come from. Um, we actually did a study, and you could see in this little clip two things that are really important. One is that we have an east-west gradient of heat across the Sydney basin, and two, that it is really dangerous, um, particularly for the elderly and the very young. Recently, we also added the outdoor workers to that because they're exposed to extreme heat conditions regularly during summer. So what you can see here is the past 15 years, data recorded from official Bureau of Meteorology weather stations um, that 
shows an alarming increase in the number of days above 35 degrees and corresponding with that also the number of days above 40 degrees. Now we are working with SIMPAC at Sydney Olympic Park and you can see data for Sydney Olympic Park in panel B on the right hand side. The population today is about 4,000 people. By 2050, we're expecting to have about 30,000 residents, which is an increase of 700, more than 700% of the local population. They need to go somewhere when it's cool. And we have predictions for even for Olympic Park that these heat days are increasing over time. We need to keep them cool. What we're doing with SIMPACT, Smart Irrigation Management, we're looking at an entire parks irrigation system to have AI and machine learning taking over the park and providing the coolest possible conditions where the plants can transpire freely because they're well hydrated. How do we do that? We use a lot of partners and the knowledge that is within the industry, but also within other universities and also government organizations. These are the partners that I'm showing you. It's a very large team, about 30 people working on this project um, that has an architecture that looks a little bit like that. It's very um, schematic and simplified but it gives you a good idea of what SIMPACT really is. So in the center, we've got the blue box with the SIMPACT environment where we have machine learning, we have a digital twin of the park. Um, we also have lots of exchange of information, um, data cleaning, data processing. We get our data from the park. You see it to the left, there's a sensor network and I'll get you some information about the sensors in a moment. We also have input um, from the BOM, Bureau of Meteorology, from weather stations and predictions for the next seven days of what kind of weather is expected. We're processing all this input from the park. We're also processing uh, what we get from the Bureau of Meteorology as forecasts. And from that, um, we're basically developing irrigation commands for the existing irrigation network in the park. You can see in our blue box at the bottom right, there is an irrigation control module that sends commands into an irrigation adapter to the left and then out into the irrigation system where field mouse is a software that operates the system. We can then go back to the left-hand side and see the response in the park from our sensors to those commands. So we're, we're having a full circle where we actually start to learn how our commands influence the moisture conditions throughout the park. We are operating about 300 plus sensors, 250 soil moisture sensors, 50 above ground um, air temperature sensors, and also a range of complete weather stations where we look at uh, rainfall and wind direction, evapotranspiration, and so on. We use all this data to feed our digital twin and our machine learning algorithms and look really into the combination of what is forecasting coming from the Bureau of Meteorology. So the conditions that we're expecting in the near future, now casting what is happening right now in the park, and then learn from our actions when we are using hind casting from all the data that is stored where we know what the conditions were and what kind of irrigation um, management we applied. And then there is also um, a live stream of data for visitors and also for managers of the irrigation system. And I wanted to use some of the time today with this webinar to show you the actual site. Um, if everything works, then this should open a new window. I'll probably pause sharing on the presentation and just switch over to the live feed from the park. So you should see the SIMPACT window. Um, if we go to Park Live, so you can you can actually go to this webpage. It's just simpact-australia.com. If we go to Park Live, we're now getting a live feed out of the park. That's why it takes a little moment to give us the data. On the left-hand side, you can see we're looking at the coolest and the warmest temperature at the moment in the park. Um, as you know, Australia is 10 hours ahead, so I'm not expecting huge differences there at the moment because it's already the night. Um, there's no heat stress, and we have what is called a park cooling effect of 2.1 degrees currently, which is a comparison of the mean park microclimate compared to the urban core to the left of the park. So we have additional weather stations 
outside the park to do these comparisons. But what is really interesting, what I wanted to show you is what is underneath all of this um, data that we're streaming from the park. So for example, we can look at soil moisture and we can also run through um, historic data, recent historic data, <clears throat> how soil moisture actually changed. You can see we had a very big rain event um, where everything turns very dark and blue across the park. So that wasn't our irrigation application, that was actual rain happening. So we can, we can check soil moisture levels online. We can also look at air temperature online. So if we just switch over to the air temperature map, these are all historic data that you can see here from the 2nd of April all the way to the most recent measurements. And you can see there are differences. Most of the warm areas are affiliated with car parks and large areas of unshaded bitumen, whereas the cooler areas are mostly um, vegetation, mostly trees, um, actually. Looking just at the map, we've got some mangroves down here that are always nice and cool. Um, we also, and this is where um, it becomes really interesting to look into the actual application of our um, sensors, we can also look at all the different stations that are irrigated. We can control actually about 200 of these stations. I'm just zooming in now. So you can see these lines in, indicate individual stations where we can switch on and off the irrigation system. And for each of these stations, if I just click on one, for each of these stations, we get additional information that tells us something about the soil moisture status. At the moment, as I said, we had a very big rain event just yesterday. So everything is really nice and moist in the park, which means we probably don't need to irrigate. So the data is building up for this station, I hope. Yep, there we go. So at the moment, we have current moisture conditions indicated. This is a soil um, analytics profile where you have saturation levels. Then you're looking at field capacity of your soil. And then at the wilting point where we really need to get on with irrigation. We also um, get a little bit of information about the actual quality that comes from the sensor, um, the data that comes from the sensor. We have some information about the management of the site and also how large the site is and how many liters of um, water per second we can irrigate through the various types of sprinklers that are present on that site. The irrigation adjustments, um, you can see at the moment, there are no predictions for the coming days because it's still wet enough. We don't need to irrigate. And we can switch if we want to just keeping plants healthy. So that will be a lower water application. Or if we want to crank up cooling and get the maximum cooling out of the park to help the surrounding environment to cool down, we can also apply the cooling option of the irrigation adjustment. A few more parameters of current readings that we get across um, this particular station, and also um, how much soil moisture change happened over um, a day or two or three or in the past week. And then we get live data predictions. So here's the soil moisture coming um, from about the beginning of March at the moment until where the dotted line is, which is right now. And after that, you can see some predictions. And I'm just switching a few things off so it becomes clear what this site actually does. So now you see historic soil moisture data in blue. You see the big rain event here. If I switch rain, again, rain event on, so you can see there was a very big rain event. Um, we can actually see the, the rainfall coming through. And then, as you would expect, uh, also on uh, more historic events here around the 14th of March, the soil moisture, of course, responds to that very quickly. Here, we can also see some irrigation application. If I switch the irrigation history on again, you can see the pink lines where irrigation was applied and you see an increase corresponding in soil moisture. We were trying in this particular station to bring soil moisture up to a saturation level. Um, and you can see there was constant application of irrigation, but then we were not irrigating because we had already very high soil moisture levels and a rainfall event was predicted. So we didn't need to irrigate. 
Now, when we look at our forecasts, I also switch on the rainfall forecast now. In purple, you can see there is still some irrigation forecasted from our Bureau of Meteorology data, and our machine learning understands that we're nowhere near the um, wilting point. So if I go back up, you can see there's the wilting point at 9.7. Field capacity is 17.6% at this side in this particular soil. We are sitting currently at about the mid 20s of soil moisture and the machine learning um, models that we are applying. You can see two outputs here that are very much overlaying each other. Um, we're predicting a further decline of soil moisture, but we're still nowhere near the, um, uh, the lower level of field capacity where we need to start and apply irrigation water. And that's why also the irrigation forecast at the moment, you can see here, there's basically a flat line. It's a bit hard to see the flat blue line underneath the, the forecasted rainfall. It's just not showing any irrigation that should be applied to this particular site. So we really have um, models that forecast where our soil moisture levels are heading because we learned from the past how this particular site responds to temperature, uh, rainfall, how fast it drains, how much moisture it can hold, and so on. And as I said, we can do this for about 200 individual sites across the park. So I could just click on any of those and get this information out of um, the online feed from the park. Lastly, we can also look at um, our actual sensors in the park. I'm just switching the irrigation zone map off and put a few other soil moisture and air temperature sensors on. And you can see, if I just zoom out, there are quite a few sensors across the park. These are all LoRa RAN sensors that stream data through three gateways into the web. And from different sites, uh, data is streamed to Perth and from there, it's processed and streamed to Tasmania and then to Newcastle and back to Sydney. So it's a lot of work that is behind um, keeping this network up to date and then coming finally to the irrigation um, processes that we need to apply across the park. I'll stop sharing here and go back to the presentation. So that is SIMPACT. And if I just finalize my presentation, um, we really, in, in Sydney, in a place, particularly in Western Sydney, where it's uh, extremely hot in summer, we may not be able to do anything about these extreme events, but we're definitely able to cool down hot summer days at around 35 degrees. Uh, as we saw, the number of these days is increasing across uh, the Sydney basin. And we really see the urban parks as um, one of the main means to reduce summer heat and to help the local populations to go through these very um, torturous events um, when we have those hot days and particularly also the hot nights. Maximizing the park cool island effect uh, can actually help to mitigate urban overheating. And with SIMPACT, we are developing a very novel solution to maximize this um, park cool island effect and really provide some real-time um, urban cooling. I'll leave it at that. I hope you enjoyed learning about SIMPACT. There's a QR code that takes you straight to the webpage and feel free to contact us if you have any further questions about the project. Thank you. I will probably hand over straight to Stefan for the second presentation. Yeah, so thank you very much, Sebastian. That's, that's a fantastic presentation and I'm sure that uh, the colleagues will have questions. So please use Q&A chat you know, the box on your screen to write your questions. So I'd like to um, take the opportunity to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Stefan Lehmann. Um, he is an internationally recognized educator, scholar, author, designer, scientific researcher, and strategic leader. He is a senior tenured professor of architecture and urbanism and former executive director of three schools of architecture, including the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, the School of Architecture in Las Vegas. He's also the director of the Interdisciplinary Urban Features Lab and CEO of the Future Cities Leadership Lab Institute, where he's translating a strategic outlook into program initiatives and positive impact, dealing with a rapidly changing profession and transforming society. 
So before joining uh, University of Nevada in Las Vegas, Stefan was a research professor of architecture innovation at the University of Portsmouth in the UK and the chairholder of the UNESCO Chair for Sustainable Urban Development for the Asia Pacific region. And Stefan was born in Stuttgart, Germany, and is a long term, you know, the collaborator and friend. So, Stefan, over to you. Thank you so much, Prashant. I also will share the screen. Does it work? Can you see? Looks okay. Okay, fantastic. So, um, again, great pleasure. Hello, everybody. Uh, very happy to be here and the structure of my presentation. I will give a short introduction and discuss about the regenerative cities and then looking ahead with some couple of reflective uh, thoughts and of course uh, look forward to our discussion um, at the end of um, uh, the presentation and so Las Vegas I'm talking to you from Las Vegas in Nevada uh, which is uh, famous for a couple of things <laughs> but uh, Las Vegas is uh, also one of the fastest growing cities in the U.S. And it is the fastest warming city in the US. Uh, and it suffers from the impact of urban sprawl, rapid expansion based on outdated urbanization model that we allowed to be applied here, causing sprawl. We are also, as I said, the fastest warming city in the entire nation, registering uh, more and more days of excessive heat. Um, furthermore, within the last 30 years, uh, we have been um, more than five times increasing the population in the valley, in what's called the valley, and as a result, have a serious water crisis and urban heat island uh, in the southwest here. We suffer from an increasing um, urban heat island effect, especially uh, downtown. So the situation is precarious. Um, I'm fighting here, working with the city and with the government for a careful increase of urban densities and for an incre incremental transformation of the city, which is always uh, interesting. Uh, work uh, is such an amazing body to work on urbanistically. Um, numerous scientists argue that at the end of the century, the Southwest region will become uninhabitable, um, as it could be unhealthy to live in cities like Las Vegas or Phoenix or El Paso. Uh, so we need more of those cooling parks that Sebastian suggested before. And those cities um, where global warming has the strongest impact. Much has also been published on the water crisis uh, on the Colorado River and Lake Mead. I'm sure you came across articles recently. The water source for 30 million people in this region, after 40 years of excessive urbanization, we have almost no drinking water left. The water level at Lake Mead at the moment is down to 22%. Um, a lot of the scientific research that we conduct uh, is on the urban heat island and opportunities for mitigation, but something I'm not going to talk so much today about. Um, here is our urban, uh, our heat map for the area. So in our research, we're looking at surface materials that do not absorb or trap solar radiation. And we explore three canopies. Uh, we are increasingly critical, which are increasingly critical to provide shade and keep the city cool. Las Vegas doesn't have um, urban parks like the UK enjoys because it's a hot and arid climate, completely different, the desert climate. Um, and uh, since we have built our cities very different from common sense knowledge and what we used to do uh, traditionally, I would argue that the urban sprawl leading to increased car dependency, loss of agricultural land, a lot of urban heat has also social consequences. We disperse the population, for instance, over vast area in low density, uh, made the population completely car dependent. Uh, leading to obesity, social isolation, increased depression uh, in the suburbs. Uh, as the, uh, the footprint of the city keeps increasing. I ask, of course, how large do you want the footprint of Las Vegas to be? Uh, the suburbs keep encroaching into the surrounded, surrounding desert ecosystem, which is a precious ecosystem. And as a result, we don't have really citizens, we have consumers forcing people to be consumers as cities grow, cities consume. A lot of our research uh, studies the city's level of consumption of water, food, materials, energy, the creation of waste and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and all this, of course, is not new. <laughs> we knew about greenhouse gas emissions and the limits of resources for 50 years. If you look back, uh, the very important book, the Limits to Growth, which was published exactly 50 years ago by a group of researchers out of MIT, is cutting all the problems of finite resources, overconsumption, and rapid population growth. It's all in that 
small book which was written half a century ago. <laughs> so nobody can say we didn't know. Therefore, we have to, uh, known for a long time what happens if we have increasing global warming as an outcome from emissions trapped in the atmosphere. And now we are struggling to keep the temperature increased by uh, plus 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. In fact, we're failing. We cannot keep the increase to 1.5 degrees. I'm afraid, despite all the COP agreements, and scientific evidence from IPCC reports, Paris Agreement, and so on, the temperatures keep rising. And we're all pretending as if nothing happens while the forest is under fire. Um, so the following graph here is, this is very interesting, I find, because it illustrates this point well. Until 1971, we used one Earth. And in terms of carrying capacity, we exactly used all the available resources of the Earth. However, since then, human population has more than doubled in the last 50 years. And now we use 1.75 Earths, which means we are in ecological overshoot. And obviously, this problem poses unmanageable risks since most resources are finite. Hence, the people are asking frequently about how much time is left until we reach the tipping point of no return that will lead to runaway temperatures, feedback loops, and unstoppable consequences. And this is a very difficult question to answer, as our computer models can only give us educated guesses. In the US here, we generate over 75% of greenhouse gas emissions by driving cars, by private transport, but also trucks. And we have an increase in SUVs. The emissions air pollution mainly comes from uh, private cars and trucks, not only producing greenhouse gas emissions, but also, of course, leading to dangerous air pollution levels, fine dust, uh, traffic accidents, congestion, and so on. So again, an unintended result caused by the low urban density which forces us to drive all the time, having built a dispersed car dependent city, not the way we could have done it. What we need to do now is to gently densify with infill projects in already built up areas. So we do away with the need to drive, uh, upgrading public space, making the city more walkable, uh, more compact mixed use and increase the access to green space. will all have positive public health impacts and the described disadvantages of low urban density are well documented, well researched, and there is plenty of scientific data uh, that it makes us less efficient, less happy, and less healthy. And so I'm suggesting always to transform the monocentric urban structures towards a more polycentric urban structure, which means uh, you have clusters of compact, walkable neighborhoods that are interconnected with very efficient public transport. Um, we're looking also, of course, at um, population health. Uh, we have a group working on population health here, and the life expectancy in the US, for example, has been declining for quite a while, not just since COVID. Uh, moreover, now the life expectancy is only 76.1 years in the US, uh, which is very low, in fact, comparing to other countries like Korea. In the data, one can see the effect of the global financial crisis, there was already a slowdown in 2009, and since 2014, a flattening, and we can see a decline in life expectancy that started long before the pandemic. Of course, we can also see the rapid drop in life expectancy between 2020 and 2022 uh, from the impact of the COVID pandemic. In comparison, the Chinese life expectancy is now higher than the life expectancy at birth of US citizens. In 2023, Chinese people have in average one year longer life expectancy, which is remarkable if you recall the low base from where China came from only two decades, uh, three decades ago. So despite all this concerning news, there's also good news. Uh, you will be aware the change has happened very quickly. For instance, to look at the registration numbers of electric vehicles. Only three years ago in 2019, 2020, 2% of all new vehicles sold worldwide were electric vehicles. Today, we have over 15% of electric vehicles sold. In the US, it's around 9% at the moment. Um, all vehicles are electric vehicles. Without, Within only three years, um, we have seen there was a rapid uptake, which currently continues. And in addition, the cost for solar photovoltaic uh, panels has come down significantly, and the products offer higher efficiency, and the cost is less than 20% of what it was 10 years ago. So solar is now the new king of the energy market, especially for cities that have very high solar radiation, uh, as cities in the Sunbelt states, Las Vegas, Phoenix, El Paso, Albuquerque, are rapidly 
uh, applying uh, photovoltaic at the moment everywhere. So over the last 30 years, my team was able to contribute a large amount of studies and relevant research to improve our understanding of urbanization impact, provide the evidence base for better decision-making, working with cities and explore different scenarios of future cities. That's basically the core of what we are doing. And we have published a lot of publications. You see some of them here. Um, principles of green urbanism, low carbon cities, urban regeneration, just to name a few. In 2010, I worked a lot on zero waste. I coined the term zero waste city. And since then we have developed large scale urban design projects exploring the concepts of density without high rise. So dense, but no high rise. Um, and also the city of short distances uh, and the research that has been peer reviewed and widely disseminated. Um, our research in urban density indicates that the most resourceful of all models is actually the 19th century urban block model of the European city, which has five, six stories, is mixed use, shared circulation, staircases between several users. It's an appropriate density at around 30 units per acre, or uh, in the European measurement, around 80 dwellings per hectare. And there, there should always be a diversity of block typologies with quiet courtyards that allow for natural cross ventilation. And interestingly, this model does not create unnecessary traffic. It does not waste valuable land or resources. It's overall a very resource efficient and energy efficient way to accommodate a higher number of people in quality housing, therefore enabling also more affordable housing. So I believe that the future is in the combination, the strategic combination of passive design principles with um, traditional architecture knowledge in combination with the latest active technological solutions. So low tech and high tech in combination, not one excluding the other, but the best of both worlds. This means that we need to use materials from close by, preferably locally sourced, low impact materials that can easily be recycled, reused. We do a research project at the moment on bio-based materials, for instance. Brick, timber comes to mind. For the previously mentioned desert cities, effective sun shading, natural cross ventilation through courtyard types, narrow self shading laneways are very good in a city like Las Vegas. Uh, these are all good ingredients, and it's something we have known for a thousand of years, but we have forgotten about it in the second half of the 20th century. So, my hypothesis would be I'd like to put forward that the world's 10,000 cities are responsible for around 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, we must rapidly decarbonize our cities. To do so, we need much better data and successful demonstration projects, so-called urban living labs, urban living labs for more informed policy formulation and for better decision making. We need a scientific evidence base, and you all contributing to this, of course, and our research institute to deliver this evidence. And the objective is to enable people to lead a happy, meaningful life. This, this needs to be the core of the objective, but not just designing new buildings, increasingly more and more adaptive reuse, repurposing existing buildings. This is not the outdated linear model of take, make, dispose and send to landfill, which has ended, I believe. Instead, we want to have a circular economy, a circular model, closing the loop, uh, of materials through waste avoidance towards zero waste, but also retaining the embodied energy, the embodied carbon in the materials of existing structures. This is really the low hanging fruit. This is the lowest hanging fruit that we can pluck and have immediate gains. We also have, more, have to do more research in the transformation of the existing building stock, how to do adaptive reuse better and qualify and upgrade the existing building stock to take advantage of what is already there and stop demolishing existing structures, but repurposing those existing structures that we have to retain the embodied carbon advantage, thinking about urban infill. This circular approach and system thinking is now gaining more and more momentum, even in the US, and people are looking at the longevity and durability of buildings and models for urban regeneration. It's a trend that has happened for many years in Europe, but uh, now taking um, everywhere hold and where we can frequently find the combination of new and old, uh, beautiful buildings, of course, old buildings and new buildings combined, I always say are more interesting than just the new or just the old. And the most sustainable building is the one that already exists. So in the US, we can observe now, for instance, that outdated tired office buildings 
C and D rated office buildings are converted into inner city apartment blocks. Crosby Apartments in Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles is a recent good example for this, but also a recently completed project in the city center of Sydney that re recycles a 1970s office tower. It's called K Quarter. It saved 8,000 tons of embodied carbon by retaining the existing concrete structure of this building. So research that is relevant to the profession combined with innovation, entrepreneurship, are the way we always were able to solve global problems. And this is the way to resolve the climate crisis. This will help us on the way out of the dilemma and we will design research our way out of this crisis. What matters now is that we have a closer look at the immediate gains we can make by reducing embodied energy in building materials and reducing operational energy demand. And this includes looking at material use of whole life cycle embodied carbon, construction materials and systems. We simply use too much materials, especially concrete, and we'll, we will need to significantly reduce it through more material efficient methods. In fact, we need to radically, radically change the way we build. And as an architect, I'm very interested in uh, the future of how we're going to build. The current emissions from concrete and steel are simply too intense and finding alternative ecological optimized construction methods has become a necessity. We need more clarity on how to increase the durability of hybrid mass timber construction systems and get more evidence from research using wood does not automatically make a building sustainable. We need to um, use the right wood for the right projects and so on. So looking at alternative building materials and construction systems for retrofitting existing structures and extending them with lightweight systems, avoiding construction waste to landfill. It's always good to build lightweight and understand better the relationship between embodied versus operational energy and carbon. Building lighter means less heavy construction, less resources, uh, and this is uh, one of the research projects looking at bio-based materials like not only wood, but also bamboo and ramped earth and building a, so, um, understanding the circular economy, building a model, but also utilizing hybrid modular offsite construction that can reduce whole life cycle carbon and waste, including those bio-based materials that I'm so interested that regrow out of the ground, such as timber, bamboo, ramped earth, and so on. So we have to ask what is the best possible use of natural resources in the design and construction sector and the main challenge for the sector is to use overall less fewer raw materials and to minimize the environmental impact over the whole life cycle so i'm almost coming to an end of my slides but this is the reason why i've established three interdisciplinary think tanks in the us in the uk at the university of portsmouth and in australia that are rethinking architecture and cities for the age of global warming, bringing together 40, 50 researchers, and in addition, building a strong network of incredible smart people. And I hope we can include uh, and work together uh, uh, with your universities on this journey together. Uh, we constantly publish, we have uh, published many uh, papers and books. And in addition, there is an architecture practice that is important because it integrates the theory into practice. The new theory that is developed in the research needs then to get into the hands of the people that can apply it globally. Very, very important. At the moment, for instance, uh, we're working on a range of projects. The declared aim of this practice is to work on regenerative design projects. Uh, we are uh, working on a sustainable lifestyle village in Costa Rica, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Uh, urban regeneration in the industrial port of Barcelona with six new building blocks and a new park, including a 15-story mass timber building. All buildings are made of mass timber. And a four-story building in Queensland at the Sunshine Coast in Noosa at the moment that's about to start construction that uses modular offsite manufactured components and principles of design for disassembly. Um, there are also other projects in which we are not involved that receives much press. The vision of a new eco city is always very exciting and very much of interest, of course. But building new cities from scratch, the utopian dream of every architect since Canberra, Brasilia, and Chandigarh um, is not the way forward. And now Neom, the line in the desert of Saudi Arabia, it is unlikely to be sustainable. These new so-called eco cities are, of course, greenwashing. And the question I want to end up is, my last slide is, 
What do we want from our cities in the future? Who should decide about the future of cities and how can we transform them in order to be healthier, greener, more resilient, socially fair, and more walkable? So I'm looking forward to your questions and you can always email me, of course, uh, at uh, those emails. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan. A fascinating presentation. Um, I could not take my eyes off, actually, uh, you know, your slides. So, so thank you very much. So I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, uh, Niria, to uh, lead on the question and answer session. Hello. Thank you again for your really fascinating talks. Um, there's a few questions already, so I'm going to just um, read them out loud for you. So for Sebastian, uh, Kristina Sodomokova asks if a SIMPAD could be applied to street trees as opposed to parks. Yes, the answer is very simple. Uh, you can apply SIMPAD to any green infrastructure project that has an irrigation system. Um, it's scalable. We're, we're working now with local governments and other utility providers um, looking at schools, hospitals, um, we could look at street trees. Sydney Olympic Park is completely irrigated. There are 300 kilometers of pipes that irrigate with grey water from a recycling plant on site. So even in Sydney Olympic Park, every street tree is irrigated and we could just, it's web-based, we could just apply Simpact to any of those irrigation outlets to then control um, soil moisture and, and maximize the cooling through transpiration. Thank you. Um, there's a, another question for uh, Stephen from uh, Tilly Collins, and um, the question is, how can we overcome the rejection of traditional architectural vernacular, which has happened in favor of the modern tall concrete glass aspiration, and to kind of reinforce the respect for simple techniques and technologies, orientation to sun, narrow streets, etc which will be critical to the sustainable development of sub saharan Africa, where many cities will be needed. And, yeah. oh, sorry. sorry, they also uh, ask if they would, uh, they would love to contribute to a think tank on urban green and urban shading. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, very interesting. Uh, also, of course, Africa, the next frontier, where, you know, cities like Lagos uh, have an incredible growth, uh, unbelievable and an increase and we need to avoid the mistakes made we actually have all the theory <laughs> we we can put it to uh we, we can we can put it to action uh and avoid the mistakes that were made in europe or in the united states especially in the us exporting this model of low density suburbanization uh we know much better we have to develop first in already built up areas where we have already the infrastructure in place uh, and it's actually not only much more sustainable and much better, much walk more walkable, but it's also cheaper. It's around 20 to 25% cheaper. There are three recent studies that have just come out, investigations in the US and in Australia that found that smart growth development using infill, urban infill with lower, will lower the construction costs for roads, utilities, and schools by 25%. And, you know, sprawl, is adding a lot of operational, higher operational costs. So urban infill is the way to go, having a clear growth boundary to contain the footprint of the city. And uh, this, uh, this allows us, of course, to do very high quality housing and urban infill using offsite manufacturing, digital manufactured um, components uh, is the future. Uh, and we need to now really rethink what kind of materials should we use for that? Where does the timber come from? Uh, there's a lot of excitement about mass timber, mass timber construction also in the UK. But again, um, I always have reservations. Uh, of course, you need a, a forestry system that's sustainably managed. That is a big problem in Africa. We have not in every country forestry systems that are based on sustainable principles. Every tree you cut down, you plant two more, uh, two new ones, for instance, but also, uh, not just because we use wood makes the building sustainable. It's more complicated, much more complicated than that. Uh, basically, the main um, advantage uh, that we can uh, harness is to reduce the amount of material, to, re to, to build with less materials and less, less weight, lightweight, 
to reduce the embodied carbon. The embodied carbon has been overlooked for a long period. We always were so focused on operational energy, operational carbon, energy efficiency. Today, we understand that the big, much bigger problem is the embodied carbon, um, and that, that leads us back to the material selection. And I know Brassan is, has done a lot of important research in this area. So yeah, a big discussion, uh, much more uh, research needed, and a, lo a lot of good people are working on those questions. But thank you for um, bringing up um, the question on Africa and the traditional, the traditional knowledge that has got lost since we had uh, automobiles and bridges and shopping malls and all those inventions of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, you know, with the flip of the uh, of the switch, we could turn on the air condition. So we didn't need any respect anymore for traditional principles of natural cross ventilation. How wonderful it is to see now electric, quiet electric vehicles um, that keep the air um, uh, cleaner, that allows us again to open the windows to the street. The big difference electric vehicles make is um, that we have the opportunity to come back to cross ventilation. We have an opportunity to open the windows at many, many apartments and buildings that face noisy, polluted road with heavy traffic that could not open the windows anymore and therefore became completely dependent on air conditioning. Electric vehicles uh, will allow us to go back to natural ventilation of housing of apartment buildings big time. So there's a lot to talk about electric vehicles. I, I'm aware of the risk and of the rare earths and of the recycling of batteries and all the problems and the missing infrastructure of charging stations so we cannot go fully electric vehicles yet, but um, we certainly have to increase uh, electric vehicles amount of percentage uh, and, and slowly get there in the next 10, 20 years. And I think we're on a good way there. So I'm very optimistic, in fact. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Abolude, and um, he asks, they ask, what types of plants do you recommend for Nigeria, West Africa? Might be a question for the two of you. I wouldn't have a clue. I'm not a, I'm not an expert of West African plant species, tree species um, that would also grow well in urban um, environments because I'm just, yeah, not an expert. So I, I rather refrain to say anything wrong. Um, I guess the same problems apply as in other uh, cities. You have to look at very poor soils, uh, compaction, uh, stress with water. You also need to look into the applications uh, of climate change. How, how well will your trees grow under predicted climate in 20, 30, 50, or 80 years? So there are lots of things that um, currently make tree selection for urban plantings really challenging. Um, in Australia, we have developed a, a national-wide database where scientists work for six years on uh, getting about, I think it's nearly 2,000 species, uh, exotics and natives uh, classified for their growth conditions and the climate matching those growth conditions also into the future. So you can actually make informed decisions today of what you should plant that then grows well in the future. I don't know if such a database would exist for Africa. I doubt it. Um, but it's definitely something that we need for any climate zone, really, to make informed decisions instead of just going with the traditionally planted species that we already see are not doing very well under current conditions and will even do less well under future conditions. So then there needs to be a shift in specific, specifically in urban planting. Yeah, I agree. As we regreen and renaturize our cities and bring greenery back more and more into the cities in, 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 in form of green roofs and green facades and more community gardens and parks and street planting of, of uh, continuous boulevards, which are street uh, tree lined, uh, tree lining uh, of streets is something we put in every master plan. But uh, the, the big question, and, and Sebastian is an expert in this, is the right selection of the tree species. A lot of mistakes have been made. Here, for instance, a new suburb has been built in Las Vegas. It's called Thummelin. And the tree they decided to plant everywhere is a palm tree. The palm is not native. It's extremely thirsty. 
<laughs> After 25 years planting palm trees, now they regret it because uh, we waste a huge amount of water on not only on our 53 golf courses that are inside the city here, but on Summerlin, this new suburb that has decided to plant hundreds of thousands of palm trees, you know, and uh, as a recommendation for the question coming back to um, your question uh, is really you need to look at native plants, which have done very well for a long time. And when you want to do something about the urban heat island, you need trees that have large leaves that create more shade, they have a beautiful crown, but also looking at uh, their thirstiness of water. And I know there are a lot of water issues in Western Africa too, like in Namibia, which has a very similar hot, arid climate like we have here. So selecting the right tree species or plant species is of the foremost importance. Uh, and uh, that uh, overview uh, table that Sebastian mentioned that has been produced for Australia and it exists in the UK and in the US, uh, uh, this has to really be done. This is the essential research work that has to be done and produced for every locality. Every locality, it needs to have that kind of tree species table for its different climatic conditions. Uh, and what is the native planting there, yeah. If I can just add to that, Stefan, um, the other thing, of course, that is critical and you've been talking about it in Las Vegas, I can talk for hours about it in Western Sydney and other parts of Australia, is what we initially discussed as the sponge city concept. You really need to keep the water where you will use it for irrigating green infrastructure. And that's why blue-green infrastructure is really the way to go. You can't have one without the other, really, um, particularly not the green aspect. So anything that is vertical or even a rooftop garden, at some point, you may even need to irrigate that. If you don't have enough water available, where does it come from? So do we need water recycling plants? Do we need to have large storage capacity of stormwater underneath the ground? So there are lots of options that we're discussing in urban design to keep water in the city. Uh, one of the big problems, and I see with very, very sad eyes that the same mistakes are done in Sydney, Western Sydney, that are done in Las Vegas, that are done in many other places in the world where urban sprawl, building flat and wide, is capping the soil. And there's a huge problem with the change in uh, rainfall events, intensity of rainfall events. We have so much runoff from all these capped soils because it's not infiltrating the soils anymore that we're building massive infrastructure just to get rid of the water to prevent flooding. That means we're losing the water very, very quickly into drainage ways, channels, and out, uh, in our case, in Sydney, into the ocean. So we really need to do much, much better to keep water on site and then use it for irrigating plants to allow them to give us the best cooling. And have per permeable surfaces yeah. that uh, run off the stormwater can meet the groundwater but also biofiltration swales and all those things that our landscape architects are using now fantastically. Uh, I agree, uh, this is uh, very, very important. Here, if it rains in winter, it rains, it pours and it floods immediately, <laughs> but then there is no rain for seven months. So it's a very extreme climate, of course, and to deal with that during seven months of drought. And we have now a 28 year drought already. You know, We have a long period of drought here in the Southwest. California, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, they're all, Utah, they're all suffering. Uh, and the Colorado River uh, is uh, looking, uh, you know, uh, accordingly, you know, we had, uh, luckily we had a lot of snow, uh, but we should not confuse weather with climate. We had temporarily a lot of snow and we had a lot of melting of the snow and ice water. So uh, uh, for a short period, the Colorado River looked okay again. And everybody was saying, ah, oh, the drought is over. But then three weeks later, we were back in the drought. <laughs> so there are temporary differences uh, that come and go. But what persists is here since 28 years, a drought, which is a very, very big concern as I spoke earlier about here. One, one point I wanna make about planting trees along streets. Every, everybody, every, every designer, every landscape architect, every urbanist wants to bring back the trees. That's, and, 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 and we know it's a good thing to have shade, continuous shade. However, planting trees in street is a big battle. It's, there, is a, there is a competition for space. You have the sidewalk, you have the curb, you have the road, you have the car parking, you have the services, 
you have all uh, all kind of things underground in uh, uh, underneath the sidewalk. So just go there and come up with a lot of tree planting in every street. Unfortunately, it doesn't is not so easy. It is more complicated than that. And uh, usually the traffic planners, the traffic engineers don't like it. <laughs> and uh, there is a lot of resistance uh, in cities when you tell cities you should simply plant another million trees uh, in all your streets. It's not that easy as it sounds. You know, there are a lot of obstacles in doing that. Well, thank you so much. Um, it would be really amazing to have the time to keep chatting. Um, there were more questions from, from us as well. Um, but um, unfortunately, we need to start um, ending the session. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you, the panelists, for your amazing talks and responses. And I'm going to give back the word to Prashant for the last remarks. Thank you, Nidia. Um, and thank you, Stefan and Sebastian. I think they, the, the presentations were fascinating and I think they do kind of, uh, you know, hit actually the real problems in the cities and what could be done to make them sustainable and how we can bring the green blue infrastructure in, into them and what kind of role actually they could play, you know, to, to sustain them in future. Um, so thank you again, uh, you know, very much. And uh, um, I just wanted to finish off uh, this webinar with the announcement of the next webinar, which will be our webinar number 12 on 3rd of May, the same time. And uh, we have two young researchers. Um, so the first one is coming from the University of Suffield and uh, she will be talking about uh, the uh, practical nature-based solutions to mitigate air pollution in a UK school playground. So you will see the use of uh, the different type of, uh, you know, the greening options, which could allow, uh, you know, to be put in the schools. The second one comes from uh, Dr. Luis uh, Inostroja. Uh, he's a senior researcher uh, in at Mandel University in uh, Brunro, and uh, I, I think that place is in Czechoslovakia. And another very interesting, you know, the presentation about uh, this, you know, can cities be sustainable? and looking from the perspective of the 21st century. So I welcome you all to join the next session. But before I finish, I would like to also um, uh, highlight a few things. So we are on LinkedIn. So if you wanted to uh, you know, get the update, so you can join us on the LinkedIn. And uh, if you just uh, put in search Reclaim Network Plus, you will see that. And then uh, you can join the, uh, the, you know, the network team. We are on the uh, the Twitter, which is at reclaim underscore network. So if you're on Twitter, please follow us so you can get some updates and you can share actually, uh, you know, the uh, the important knowledge you have, might have generated in this area through the uh, through the post. And uh, um, there is a loads of resources on our website, which is called reclaim-network.org. We recently launched a um, uh, the new uh, the page there, which is called resources, and uh, we will be uh, requesting all our members to put any important information uh, related to the uh, the green blue infrastructure and uh, um, put the entry there so that others can follow and they can uh, you know benefit from it. And uh, um, you can see the uh, you know the 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 kind of the link in the chat box about this reclaim um, you know the page. And if you are interested to be a a speaker or any information you want to know about the Reclaim Network, just write an email on info at reclaim-network.org. Uh, that is meant by um, us and uh, um, it's basically Mark, Sarlot and myself and the other team members. So we are looking after this email box and we'll be coming back to you. Um, before I say thank you to everyone, I would like to also mention our colleagues, you know, the Mark and Charlotte, who have been working really hard in the background to keep this webinar running. So thank you very much, guys. And thanks to again to our both the speakers and our chair of the session, Nidia, for this wonderful, um, uh, you know, the webinar session. And you can see the webinar recording uh, on the YouTube channel, which we'll be sending you the, um, the, the messages with the link at some point soon. So again, thank you very much, everyone. See you in the next webinar.